Chemistry, the Central Science, Chapter 1, Introduction, Matter and Measurement, Lesson 1. So the study of chemistry is really taking a look at the world around us and then trying to explain what's happening on a molecular level, because this is what is happening, is atoms are doing their thing, going through chemical reactions, going through physical changes, and this is what we see around us. So our macroscopic view here is a pile of rusty nails. Well, what's actually happening is the iron in the nails is reacting with the oxygen in the air to form rust or iron three oxide. So here we have two elements coming together. Elements are only one particular type of atom and all of those atoms have the same properties in terms of their chemical properties. Physical properties can differ a little bit, but you cannot break an element down any further without changing what it is, right? Atoms can break down into consisting of protons, electrons, and neutrons, and then phys physicists have shown there's quarks and bosons and all that kind of stuff, which I don't totally understand, but I guess they're all there. So each atom of a particular element is the same, Atoms of different elements are different. They react differently. They have different chemical properties. Some of them can have the same physical properties. Um, but atoms are your smallest particle of a particular element, which still retains all of its properties. So it's basically the fundamental property of matter. Like you cannot break it down any further. When you take two atoms and combine them together, you can form a molecule. Those atoms can be different or they can be the same. Here we have a molecule of oxygen and here we have a compound of iron three oxide. So what is matter and what is chemistry? Well, chemistry is the study of matter and the changes it undergoes. All chemistry is looking at is everything around us. So everything around us is matter. If you are going to have matter, you have to have substance, you have to have some stuff there, and you have to occupy space. So simply put, anything that has mass and volume is matter. And we can describe certain properties of that matter. So your property are identities, qualitative and quantitative, that describe how that matter behaves or what it looks like, things like that. So we'll look at physical properties, chemical properties, extensive properties, intensive properties. So they all just describe something about that matter, that particular matter. And down here we just see water is matter, gold is matter, sugar is matter, the air we breathe, that is all matter. So things we see and things we don't see, everything in the universe has matter. So why is chemistry relevant to us in our everyday lives? First of all, it's everywhere around you. Uh, I drink tea in the morning. That tea that I make goes through a physical change of extracting the tea into the water. It's filtering out the, right, I have uh, the thing that keeps the tea itself from being in the water that I make, right? The actual tea bits, the leaves, the same thing happens with coffee. Um, I put milk and sugar in my tea in the morning. It dissolves. That's a chemical process or sorry, a physical process of dissolving my sugar into my tea. Then I brush my teeth, the toothpaste that I use, wash my hair, use soap, all that good stuff. All of those things are chemical compounds. Everything we touch in our lives has chemistry associated with it. Water is a chemical. We don't think about it because when we think chemicals, we think of harmful things, but water is a chemical. It is a compound. So, Health and medicine, speaking of water, right? We have sanitation systems that help to purify our water. Sometimes it works really well, sometimes it doesn't. We know that there was the water crisis in Flint where there is an obscene amount of lead and lead is a poison. Lead will replace specific ions in your body that you need to have your enzymes work. And once they're there, they you can't get rid of it. So people get really sick because of having lead. Um, so it's good to have clean water. Surgeries, vaccines, antibiotics. So using different types of anesthesia, those have been developed through the years. Ether was one of the first anesthetics that was used, but it is highly flammable. So you could potentially blow up. 
So scientists, chemists looked at how can we modify these compounds, retain the same properties of being able to knock you out before they cut you open, but have it be less dangerous to handle. Uh, vaccines and antibiotics, uh, there's been a push to try to not have so many antibiotics that we're taking. If you're not really sick with the bacteria, an antibiotic is not going to work. And since we've been overprescribed antibiotics, we have superbugs now, these super bacteria that have become antibiotic resistant, which is really dangerous. Um, and then, you know, do you get a flu vaccine? Have you, when you were kids, you got your measles, mumps, and rubella shots, right? Um, and of course, there's controversy over whether to vaccinate or not to vaccinate. As well as in health and medicine, right, there's always developments of new drugs. We see this on the TV all the time. Take this for this. Take this for that. Um, you know, cancer research is really big in terms of chemotherapy versus immunotherapies and what kind of targeted treatments can they use. Uh, so chemists are all in the labs working on this kind of stuff. Energy and the environment, fossil fuels. So right, we're all still burning gasoline. There's still coal plants to produce our electrical energy that we need, but we know that we're producing a lot of CO2. Carbon dioxide is what we call a heat sink. So it absorbs heat, keeping the planet warmer than if there wasn't so much CO2. That is science. Um, now the debate is whether where all that CO2 is coming from. I've read studies lately that say that actual livestock, so the cows that we're breeding for our milk and our meat, are producing more CO2 than all of the cars that we have. So it's still an issue that we need to look at because the more, the hotter the planet gets, the more, uh, the less oxygen would be dissolved in lakes and streams, um, the more catastrophic weather events that we're going to see because more energy just means stronger stuff. Like that's just the science behind it. Um, so solar energy versus nuclear energy. Solar energy is a clean source of energy. We also have wind farms now. So what can we look at around us naturally that we can harness? Well, the sun is free, right? So solar panels have become less expensive. A lot of people are putting those on their houses now. Um, wind farms, they can be noisy, they can be ugly to look at, but there's no pollution involved, right? Uh, nuclear energy is still a source of energy, but there's the potential for radioactive fallout, right? A nuclear fallout. And we can't, it's extremely hard to remove radioactive substances from the environment and not have them contaminate the ground, the water, the air around us, and uh, those types of things, right? Um, radioactivity can cause DNA changes, can cause cellular changes. You get really, really sick if you're exposed to radioactive substances. So it's something to think about. Where do we get our energy? Because we all have to turn our lights on. Uh, but how is this affecting the world around us? What else? Materials and technology. So polymers are all around us as well. All of the plastics that we use, that is a particular type of polymer, uh, whether that be PVC uh, pipes in your house for your plumbing or the plastic bag that you get at the grocery store, which you should just use re reusable bags, um, your plastic water bottles get a filtered water bottle or one that you can reuse because all of these plastics that we put out into the environment do not break down. So then there's studies of can we use plant-based materials that would be biodegradable, getting rid of plastic straws, getting rid of one-time plastic usage stuff. Uh, room temperature superconductors. So typically if you're gonna have a superconductor, you have to have extremely cool temperatures to make that work. It's really, difficult to pull all that energy away. Um, so can we get computers computing really fast, but at potentially room temperature, right? So it doesn't have to be so cold. And then molecular computing simply means instead of using our silicon-based technology, which all of our computers run off of silicon and other trace metals, um, can we use DNA or other small molecules to perform the same jobs? 
And lastly here, um, as our examples, would be food and agriculture. So if you look on things you buy at the grocery store, it might say non-GMO certified. So that means that it does not have a genetically modified organism in it. There, of course, is debate as to whether or not GMOs are good or bad for you is, you know, you're digesting them and you're getting these atoms into your body, as well as the actual environment and the way that crops are produced and the way that certain crops need to cross pollinate, etc. What is the good side and the bad side of using GMOs? Using natural pesticides as opposed to things that have phosphates in them, right? There's been cases of uh, landscapers who are using uh, products, especially through Monsanto, that then they're developing cancer because they're exposed to these chemicals. So what can we use instead? Can we introduce certain types of bugs back into the system that are going to eat the harmful bugs? Can we use things like diatomaceous earth or lemon oil, uh, et cetera, to repel bugs that aren't going to harm the crops? They'll still do the same job, um, but what we're putting into the environment then isn't going to hurt anybody else, hurt the animals, hurt the rest of the plants and human beings. So chemistry is all around us. These are a few examples. So we can classify matter in different ways. The three main states of matter are going to be gases, liquids, and solids. So a gas is a substance that has the particles as far apart as they possibly can be. They're moving extremely fast. And a gas is going to have an indefinite volume and an indefinite shape, which simply means it's going to take on the space and the shape of whatever container it is in. So over here, we can see that this gas is occupying the entire flask. If we put this into a balloon instead, it's going to take on the shape and whatever space that the balloon would be. Because there is so much space between the particles, that means that gases are highly compressible. So you can shove those particles in a smaller space, which is really good when you need to go to the gas station and fill your tires with air because they've gotten low. So liquids, your particles are closer together, but they still have some freedom of movement. So they are moving around, not as fast as what a gas does, but we know that liquids flow, right? We can pour them. A liquid is going to take on the shape of the container, but it's going to have its own volume. So regardless of what container you pour it into, it's going to retain its volume, but it's going to take on the shape. So liquids have a definite volume, but an indefinite shape. Solids are substances where the, molecule, or the at molecules or atoms are as closely packed together as they can possibly be. So there's almost zero freedom of movement. Um, they can vibrate a little bit, um, but that's pretty much it. And with a solid, you have a definite volume and a definite shape. So it doesn't matter what kind of container you put it in, it's always going to retain its volume and its shape. And the way that we can convert between solids, liquids, and gases is simply going through a certain type of physical change, which we'll talk about later, but you can either add energy or remove energy, and we can go between these phases of matter. So another way that we can classify matter is whether it is a pure substance or a mixture. So a pure substance is only going to have one particular thing present. There would be uniformity throughout. So the two types of pure substances that we can look at would be an element versus a compound. Your element is only going to have one type of atom present, oxygen, fluorine, argon, lead, Mercury, you just have one, one type of atom, one type of element. Now you can take some elements and undergo a reaction to form a compound. So a compound is when you take two different elements and they are now bonded together. So water is a compound, sugar is a compound, salt is a compound because you've taken different atoms and now they're bonded together. 
Salt is sodium chloride, sodium and chlorine. You have two different elements, but if you have a can of salt, it's all salt. So it is a pure substance. Now, if you want a mixture, you can combine elements and compounds, compounds and compounds, two different elements and mix them together. So you have two different choices here, a homogeneous uh, mixture or a heterogeneous mixture. Homogeneous means that the composition is the same throughout. Homogeneous mixtures are also called solutions. So they have every sample that you would take from that particular substance would be the same. I drink milk in the morning. So milk is a homogeneous solution. Why? Because every sip of milk that I take has the same amount of water, fats, and sugars in it right? You don't have separation there. You're not going to just drink the water portion. And then as you get going through your gallon of milk, then you have all the sugar, right? It's the same throughout. A heterogeneous mixture is the opposite of that, where each sample that you would take would look different from where you took it from. So I'm showing down here in the corner, a mixture of salt or not salt of um, sand and iron. If I were to take a spoon and spoon out some of this sand iron mixture, it's not going to look the same because some parts would have more iron, some parts would have more sand. So heterogeneous mixtures are looking at something where when you take the sample, it does not look the same as what you took it from. So separation techniques are looking at ways that we can separate mixtures back into pure substances. One way to do this is a distillation. Distillation means that you're gonna separate two liquids, two or more liquids based on their boiling points. So the substance with the lowest boiling point is going to evaporate off first and you would collect it. And you can keep going through this process until you have all of your different liquids. With our sand and iron mixture, we can use a magnet because we look at the physical property of, a mag of iron being magnetic and sand not being magnetic. So we can pull out all the iron filings and then we would have iron, which is an element, and then we would have our sand, which is a compound. So here's a classification scheme of looking at matter in terms of how do we identify if something is a mixture or a pure substance. So if you have a mixture, it means that you can separate those things by physical means into a pure substance. And we know that with mixtures, you either have something that is the same throughout, homogeneous, or different throughout, heterogeneous. If it's a pure substance, you either have a compound or an element. A compound can be separated by chemical means to get back to all of its respective elements. So compounds are a combination of two different elements that have bonded together. And elements are just one particular type of atom. So what are the physical processes of matter? Well, we can look at a physical property and a physical change. So physical property is going to be something that identifies a piece of matter. And by identifying it, you're not changing what is there. So physical properties are often things that we can observe with our five senses. What does it look like? Does it have a color associated with it? Is it a liquid or a solid or a gas? Uh, does it have a particular smell to it? If it's a solid and you touch it, does it feel hard? Does it feel soft? Um, these are all physical properties. Density, right? That's a physical property. When you measure the substance's mass and compare it to its volume, you're not changing anything about that substance. So a physical change then is looking at how can we go between solids, liquids, and gases. A physical change does not change the substance that you have. It's just going to look different, right? Ice is water. Liquid water is water. Steam is water. It's all H2O. It's just in a different phase. So physical changes do not change the identity of the substance. And I'd already talked about distillation, which is this center apparatus here. 
Um, but a physical change has occurred when you make coffee or you make tea because you're actually extracting out particular compounds from the tea or coffee. Um, you're filtering it. That is a physical process, a physical change. Um, over here, this is showing chromatography, which separates things into colors, chroma. That's what the chroma means. And you can separate uh, substances based on physical properties of intermolecular forces, which we'll talk about. How attracted are you to a solvent? How attracted are you to a paper? And they separate based on that. So chemical processes of matter. Chemical properties versus a chemical change. So chemical property, this property is going to describe the way something behaves or the way something reacts. So if a substance is flammable, right, that means you can ignite it on fire. Combustible means that it reacts with oxygen. Um, does it react with an acid? Does it react with a base? These are chemical properties because you're looking at how the identity of that substance and what change it could possibly undergo that actually changes the substance. So chemical changes then are any type of reaction. We are changing the identity of the substance and you typically can't go back easily. All Anytime you cook anything, you bake muffins, you cook an egg, these are all chemical changes. You cannot undo that. Once the egg is cooked, it's cooked, right? Um, so down here I'm showing hydrogen gas reacting with oxygen as a gas to form water. So we take two elements, um, hydrogen and oxygen. These are also molecules because we have more than one atom present. And then we form a compound of H2O. This is a compound because there are two different atoms bonded together, two different elements. So hydrogen is flammable. It's combustible. That is a chemical change that hydrogen undergoes to form water. We also have quantitative versus qualitative properties. Um, and quantitative means it depends on the amount that is there. Qualitative means it's just the quality of the substance. So it doesn't matter how much is present, it still retains that same property. So extensive properties are anything that you're going to measure. Uh, how much volume does something take up? Is there some sort of distance associated with it or a length? What is the mass of the substance? Um, these are things that you measure and report with a number, right? That is an extensive property. Now, an intensive property doesn't depend on how much stuff is there. So oftentimes our intensive properties are a lot of the physical properties we talked about, as well as certain chemical properties. Hydrogen is going to react with oxygen regardless of how much you have. Um, so it's an identity, once again, that does not depend on how much of a substance is there. Density is an intensive property. Color, hardness, odor, um, it because it doesn't matter how much you have. It still just has that property. So last thing to talk about here is the scientific method. And this is just simply the process that has been kind of well-defined as to how we approach trying to explain the world around us. So we always start with our observations. So what natural phenomena do we see? And then how are we going to explain it? So in this particular example, we have an observation that milkmaids don't contract smallpox. Okay, so now we want to come up with a tentative explanation as to why we see this observation. The hypothesis here is having contracted cowpox Milkmaids have a natural immunity to smallpox. So how do we test this? We set up an experiment to prove whether our hypothesis is correct. And this is the way this works. And a lot of scientists have gotten in trouble because what they'll do is they're, they will fudge their results to say, oh no, this supported my hypothesis. It supported my theory on this. You can never change your numbers. You don't change the results that you get to match the hypothesis. If your experimental results do not match, then you go back and you change the hypothesis. And this can be a very tedious procedure, um, but this is the way it's supposed to work. So if you get good results, 
So our experiment was intentionally expose a healthy child to cowpox and later to smallpox. So you run this test and then you come up with a model or a theory. Your set of conceptual assumptions that explains the data from all of your experiments and then you use that to predict related phenomena. So our results showed that the child did not contract smallpox so immunity seemed to have resulted from cowpox exposure. So this is kind of a process of how can we come up with vaccines? So then what do we do? We do further experimentation to make sure that our results are 100% consistent. And then, we and then we test our predictions as well. So the further experiment would be, hey, expose humans to cowpox virus and confirm the model. So you start with a small sample and then you use a larger sample. So if once again with the experiment, it doesn't prove your results, then you have to go back and modify your theory. So you're either modifying your hypothesis, you're modifying your theory so that the results that you get match. It's, it's not the other way around. You, you cannot make up your results to match your theory. You change your theory to match your results. And it's a cyclical process and we work together to try and come up with a set of theories then that help to explain stuff or a set of laws that will explain the things we see around us. So the things that result from the scientific method are laws and theories. They are both just as valid. So when somebody says, oh, it's just a theory, no, that's not, that's not true. A theory has still been proven time and time again to be correct until it's proven wrong, which is true about laws as well. So laws are typically a mathematical relationship that can be derived from your set of experiments. So for example, Newton's, one of Newton's law, force equals mass times acceleration. That is a law. There's laws that explain the way gases behave, like Boyle's law and Charles' law and Avogadro's law. We have uh, the law of conservation of mass, the law of conservation of energy. There's all kinds of laws associated in thermodynamics. And these are all going to be mathematical relationships. Now, a theory, for example, like the Big Bang Theory, Scientists have been, you know, testing, trying to prove somehow of what, how the universe came to be, right? And this is one of the theories. There are other theories that scientists have done experiments and said, hey, no, this is how we think this happened. Um, there's the atomic theory of matter that Dalton came up with that describes atoms and how they behave and what they consist of, what their properties are. There's the kinetic molecular theory of gases. So once again, how are gases behaving? So theories are more of a, a explanation, you know, describing what's going on, where laws are a mathematical relationship that is describing what is going on, but they're both just as valid as the others. 